Well, good morning, everyone. Well done for all of you coming through the, the storm today. S storm Ashley, I gather. Lovely names they have for the storms. Uh, before we start, just a quick note. Next Saturday we have our Doogie Mac coffee morning. And Liz has asked that if anyone is making cakes for that, can you let her know so that she can coordinate it, please? We welcome all contributions of cakes because that's something that's very popular. And on Tuesday, Tuesday evening, we've got our, it's actually our fifth, I think, Bible study. Um, but it's actually on chapter 4, Ephesians. I know certainly one person has been doing quite a bit of study in advance. <laughs> Let's still our minds for a moment and as we come into the presence of the Lord. Some verses from Psalm 118. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress I called upon the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side and I will not fear. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes and kings. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. I thank you that you've answered me, Lord, and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvellous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is that lovely hymn, The Church's One Foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord.
Let us pray. Living God, we praise you that you have indeed become our strength and our redeemer and that you have become our salvation. We praise you that you listen to all our prayers, both great and small. We thank you for graciously hearing our petitions. But above all, we thank you for the gift of your Son, who freely gave his life and paid for our sins to set us free. Living God, we praise you that long ago you planned to save mankind from itself, from its disobedience to your ways, from its continual denial of you and your goodness, from the persecution of those that seek you. Living God, we come today to praise you indeed for your steadfast goodness to us each and every day. <coughs> Lord, we're sorry that we don't always acknowledge that acknowledge all that you do for us day by day. Lord, you know our minds are so often on trivial things and not seeking to see your works, the works of your hands all around us. We come in penitence and shame for our failings, Lord Jesus, for failing to live as you taught us, <coughs> failing to think as you taught us, for failing to act as you taught us. Lord, may we as your church start to become better examples of your love, your care, your forgiveness in the world. May we seek to help our neighbours, friends and strangers and then lead them to you who is the only source of hope in this dark and sinful world. We join in the words that Jesus himself taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our next hymn reminds us that we have only one thing to base our faith on. My hope is built on nothing less.
Not an easy tune to follow that for some reason. <coughs> I think it has a stutter in the line. I think that's the, what caught us all out. Anyway, can we take our offerings now for God's work in this place, please? Lord, we thank you for all your goodness to us. We offer you these gifts of money, both given here in the church and faithfully online. We ask you to bless all those who give and also bless the money that it can be used to further your kingdom and to proclaim your gospel in this place. In the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now Liz is going to come. Unfortunately, I think, um, not the stilling of the storm list. <laughs> it would have been appropriate. <laughs> Mind you, there was that line in the hilm about the wild and yes, I know. wind or something. There was a lovely line about the storm in the... In the yeah. If the streaming is working, because it still hasn't said it started, it says it's starting, then for those who are watching, we have quite a storm here. Hence the comments. This story this week actually took place just before the story last week. Sorry about that, but never mind. This is called The Marvelous Picnic. It wasn't long before G lots of people wanted to hear Jesus talk about God, <coughs> and many more wanted him to make them well, so they followed him everywhere, from town to town, from city to country, and all the way back again. We need a rest, said Jesus to his friends one day. So they took a little boat trip across Lake Galilee, hoping to camp for a while in the hills beyond. But the people were so eager to see Jesus that they raced round the shoreline to meet him on the other side. Jesus was tired, but when he turned and saw the people following him up the hill, he stopped. They're like sheep without a shepherd, he said to his friends. They need someone to show them the way. So he sat down himself right then and there, and he started to teach. God loves you, Jesus said. He knows what's best for you. The most amazing things can happen when you trust him. Jesus said a lot more than that. He taught all day, in fact, and by then the people were hungry. Philip, Jesus called to one of his friends, can you go out and buy some food for these people? Philip just laughed. There are more than 5,000 of them. It would take six months' pay to feed them all. Then Andrew, Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a boy here, Jesus, who has a little food, five loaves of bread and two fish. But it's not much, but it's a start. So it is, grinned Jesus, and he rubbed his hands together as if he was about to go to work. Make the people sit down in little groups. Tell them we're going to have a picnic. Jesus' friends looked at Jesus. They looked at the boys' little lunch. They looked at the enormous crowd. Then they looked at each other and shrugged. All right, they agreed, whatever you say. Jesus smiled as he watched them go. Then he bowed his head and thanked God for the food and started breaking it into pieces. The friends returned and began to pass out the pieces. And to their amazement, there was plenty for the first group, and the second group, and the third group, and then every group. Plenty for everyone. More than enough to go round. So much, in fact, that there were 12 baskets full of leftovers to take home. 
The people patted their tummies, they struggled to their feet, they wiped the crumbs from their mouths, and some even burped. But all Jesus' friend could, friends could do was stare. It's just as I told you, said Jesus. God can do the most amazing things. All we have to do is trust him. Then he smiled at his helpers, popped a chunk of bread into his mouth, and started off for home. Now, if you've ever wondered what your dreams meant, <laughs> so they did in Daniel's time. Daniel uh, chapter 2, verses 24 to 45. Then Daniel went up to Arioch, who the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, said to him, No, do not ex execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king. I will interpret his dream for him. Ariok took Daniel to the king at once. I found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. The king asked Daniel, Are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel replied, No wise man, enchanter, magician or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you were lying in bed are these. As your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come, and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so that your majesty may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. Your majesty looked and there before you stood a large statue, enormous, dazzling, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms silver, the belly thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron, partly of baked clay. And while you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff in the threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it for the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands, he has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the sky. And wherever they live, he has made you ruler over all of them. You are the head of gold. After you, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as Brian, iron <laughs> breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. And just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. 
yet will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. Here is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Liz, and thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. So I'm just looking for two more verses, if I can... Sorry, there's, there's two more verses to come. I beg your pardon. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. Amen. Thank you very much. That, of course, was the conclusion of the, of the dream. Before we have the message from that reading, we're going to sing that lovely song with the help of the Chet Valley Church recording, Faithful One So Unchanging. i 
strange how all our hymns today seem to mention the storm, and that actually wasn't the reason why they were chosen. <laughs> Just works out that way, doesn't it? Our reading today tells us of the story of the dream of Nebuchadnezzar that was so disturbing that it upset his mind and troubled his spirit and prevented him from sleeping at night. I know the feeling. We're told that in the first part of that chapter that he challenged his wise men, enchanters and magicians and so forth, to not only interpret the dream, but also to tell him what the dream was in the first place. I don't think he'd forgotten it, but I think that he wanted to test those around him, to tell him the truth. He was sick of the sycophants telling him what they thought he longed and tell them the dream first, before, of course, fobbing him off with some old rubbish to make him feel good. Come to think of it, um, I've sat through many a sermon that did exactly the same thing to me. The feel-good factor that didn't even seem to last till the end of the sermon. A sermon of feel-good platitudes does not feed the soul. So Nebuchadnezzar decided to execute all his advisers, which on reflection seemed a bit drastic. But kings did that sort of thing in those days. It was Daniel himself, under the threat of death, of course, who persuaded the captain of the king's guard to stay the execution till he could have a word with the king. But first, Daniel had some important work to do. He talked with his God. And God revealed the dream to him. So Daniel, of course, gave thanks to God in one of the most wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells in him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors, that you've given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You've made known to us the dream of the king. Sorry, could we just have the back door closed? As a, you may not feel it from there, but I, I, I feel a cold draft. Thank you very much. Thank you, Comfort. Now, of course, he's ready to go to the king and reveal the dream and, of course, the interpretation. You may note that Daniel takes no credit for being able to do this, saying quite clearly that there is a God in heaven who reveals all mysteries. Of course, you will have noticed probably that there are parallels here to Joseph. Remember, And yet he was called by God to interpret Pharaoh's dream to him. Now, I've read a great number of words by apparently very learned men about this dream. Commentary after commentary maunder on 
about the significance of what these kingdoms were. What was represented by the gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron, the mixture of iron and clay? They argue back and forward. Was this the Medes? Was this the Persians? Was this the Greeks? Was this Alexander the Great? Was this the Romans? They entirely miss the point. Some of them do add a little postscript about it, an also ran idea. But what was the point of the dream? The rock. Of course, it is the rock cut out from a mountain with no human hand that brings down and destroys all the kingdoms of the world and shows that, that what man values is law. The rock cut from the mountain is the point of the story. The rock that having destroyed all earthly kingdoms becomes a mountain itself and fills the whole earth. Now when you look at the writers at the time, people like Isaiah and Micah, you'll find very similar ideas in their scriptures. Isaiah 2 says, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Micah 4 has exactly the same passage in it. And of course, they both did live in Judea at the same time. Now, we tend to associate eschatology with the New Testament. Sorry, that was a long word, wasn't it? Mm, eschatology has a lovely ring to it. Eschatology is the term used to denote the end of human history, the end of the world, the time when God will roll, a time when the very mention of the name Jesus will cause every knee in heaven and under the earth and on the earth to bow before him, as we're reminded in Philippians. Eschatology is a fascinating study on its own and can be traced right from the very beginning of Genesis right the way through the Bible to the final chapter of Revelation. It's one of the most consistent messages of all the Bible. After life, we face judgment. It marks the time when man's consistent disobedience to God and his commands have consequences. The book of Daniel is so brimful of visions of the end times. So full of visions that he was actually told at the end that his books must be locked away till the end of time. And although Daniel seems to be dealing largely with his own time, as is true of all prophets, relates to the end of times with terrifying visions of the future. The book of Revelation, of course, as we know, has some pretty graphic descriptions of the final battles between good and evil. Spoiler alert, guess who wins? So back to the dream again. Just who or what was the rock in the dream? Well, quite obviously, it was Christ. 
Christ being foretold. Paul points out in 1 Corinthians 10, when he spells this out and says that Christ is the rock that follows the Hebrews through the desert to give them water. And Jesus told the woman by the well that he could give her the living water. Much earlier, Moses referred to God as his rock of salvation in his final song to the children of Israel in Deuteronomy 32. The idea that God was a rock of salvation appears in the psalm, God, my rock in whom I take refuge, and so on through the psalms. The dream clearly states that this rock, and we can be sure that it was Jesus himself, shatters and brings down every kingdom, every empire in this world, comes to an end. As the line in that lovely hymn says, Earth's proud empires fade away. As David in Psalm 46 says, God is our refuge, and he will not be moved. But it is he who utters his voice. It is the word of God and the world melts away. He goes on and says, come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations that he's brought on earth, he makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow, bow and shatters the spear, burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I'll be exalted on the earth. The obvious, not easily moved or shaken, a refuge for those in need. David himself hid in a rock cave when his life was in danger. But alongside this idea of God being the rock, another repeated message about a stone developed in Jewish literature. 1300 years BC, Job is asked by God, where were you when I laid the foundation stone of the earth? We read that in Job 38. And from this came the idea of the foundation stone that God had already laid and that would in the future redeem the world. Job called his rock his redeemer and these two ideas took hold in Jewish writing. 600 years later Isaiah quotes God saying that this was his cornerstone laid down so long ago as, and it was to become the stone of stumbling to the houses of Israel. And he says this stone will cause offense in a cornerstone and a sure foundation. And how true this is of Christ himself causing offence. He upset set the status quo of the complacent religious leaders of the day, causing people to take offence with his words, like the rich young man who was sent sorrowful away, like the Pharisees being offended by his healing on the Sabbath. I have a list of over 59 verses in the Old Testament that show the idea of a rock that was the foundation stone laid before the creation of the world, which was to become the redeemer of the future. You'll be glad that I won't quote them all.
Jesus in Matthew 21 says clearly that he who falls on this stone will be broken into pieces and that the stone will scatter him like dust to the four winds. Shades of our reading, I think, today. The first three gospel writers record Jesus saying, the stone that the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. This idea was to be expanded in Luke, in Acts. Paul Paul's, talks about it in Romans, Ephesians, Peter in his letter. You can trace this idea all the way through. Time and again, the New Testament writers talk about the rejected stone becoming the cornerstone or keystone of a new building, a new form of temple or church of Christ here on earth. Which, of course, is where the Spirit of God himself will live. Peter spells out that those who stumble do so because of their disobedience to the word. Hence, they are destined to doom. So here's the heart of the matter. Mountains play an important part in revealing God's glory to Moses, to Elijah, the transfiguration, and so on, you can think of many examples, is a very powerful metaphor for the birth of Christ. And this, of course, was foretold to a Gentile king, a sign of what was to come. On the internet, people write reams and reams of verbiage, trying to claim that Jesus is a fairy tale that we should no longer believe. But hold on. Where are the reams and reams about Cinderella? Where are the reams about Cinderella proving that she wasn't real? The fact is that Jesus still causes offense. He is still a stumbling stone for people. And they seem quite irate sometimes that we should actually believe in him. Him who has the power to save us. In this day of shifting sounds of psychobabble, belief in the powers of stars or crystals or whatever, in cards and so on, before the creation of the world, and the rock that chose us to be with him. Amen. Really, only one rock, only one hymn we could have after that. Rock of Ages, cleft for me.
We come now to our time of intercessions. Living God, we pray for the leaders of the country where open conflict is exacting such a terrible toll on human lives, both in death and injuries. We pray that the leaders may, might realize that they can achieve nothing by destruction of life and property except to build hatred and revenge. While we know that ultimately you will crush every kingdom on earth, we pray that in the meantime common sense might prevail and negotiations lead to ceasefires and a return to normality. Lord, we pray for this earth that you've created as a perfect place for us to live. But as we're now facing the consequences of those that have exploited the earth for financial gain, we pray for those who face ever more violent weather events, hurricanes, typhoons, storm surges, weather bombs, floods, and wildfires. Lord, we pray for those who rescue those involved and have to do the mopping up afterwards, often at the risk of their own lives. Lord, as we hear tragically of yet another young musician jumping from a high building to escape the demons of his mental health. We pray for those in the health departments of the world to focus upon the causes of mental health rather than just giving pills to mask its very real effects. We pray that those who are suffering from anxiety or depression or indeed loneliness could find the help that they really need. May they be bold to admit that they have problems with life and seek help before it is too late. And may those around them help in the process of getting them to help. Lord, as we approach another winter here in our own land, we pray that the rollout of flu and COVID jabs will be taken up by the majority of people in the vulnerable sections of the population. That people will not be put off by the fear of side effects <coughs> that some have had, had to put up with nor any of the false rumours that these jabs have ulterior motives. May they see them for what they truly are, as preventative, so that these killer diseases will not spread to the population this winter. As people struggle with the yearly balance of finances over the winter, we pray that our government will give help where it is most needed. Help us all to be mindful of our neighbours and willing to help where we can. We pray for our twice weekly cafes here in the church that people will be attracted to the warmth of welcome and the chance to meet with each other in a safe warm environment. Lord, as a church, we seek your will for us so that people will come to see you as their rock of salvation rather than a stumbling block. 
and as always, we pray that you will be with all those who mourn, walk with them in their grief and sorrow, reassuring them that your mighty hands are there to uphold them. And all of this we ask in the precious name of Jesus, our rock, our redeemer, and our salvation. Amen. We end our service this morning with the hymn, Lord of the Years. Reminding us again that God never leaves us. He is always with us. bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance toward you and give you peace, now and forevermore. Amen.